Hello, listeners, and welcome to the Downright Upright Show, the place to go to hear out loud and proud what Minnesotans are thinking. And I am your host, Philip Anthony. I am so happy that you can join us today, and I hope you're all doing fantabulous. My special guest today is the founder and artistic director of the Chamber Choir Exultate and composer and church musician Tom Rossen. Hello, Tom, and welcome to the Downright Upright Show. Well, hello, and uh, thank you for, for coming. Oh, and thank you for doing this for us. How, how are you doing today? Are you doing well? I'm fine. I have rehearsals tonight. And we're getting ready for concerts. Yeah, I was, that's what I heard. And thank you. You have a busy schedule and you took your time out, so I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, in advance uh, of discussing your uh, distinguished career, would you tell the listeners where you were born, raised, and went to school, and anything else you'd like to add to that? Sure. Um, I was born in Minneapolis here. Uh, and uh, I, I, my family has four children. There are four children and my mother and father. We lived here for a short time and, uh, and then moved to Indianapolis, Indiana, because my father was uh, in uh, electrical engineering, and he worked for RCA then when they were making televisions uh, oh, in wow, Indianapolis. Oh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> so we moved there and lived there for three years, but then we moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, Dad got a job with the Lear Siegler company, the Lear Jet, uh, but they were making things for the for the um, space uh, program, and uh, we moved there. And I I grew up there in Grand Rapids, Michigan, until I went to college, uh, and uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful time. Um, the, the college I went to is uh, Valparaiso University in in Valparaiso, Indiana. I have a bachelor of music education from there. And then I moved here to Minneapolis, went to the University of Minnesota. I was a graduate assistant and worked on and received a Master of Fine Arts. Uh, then, I, then I went out teaching. Uh, I was in Brainerd High School for years. It was one of the top uh, high schools in the nation before I even got there. So it was a, just a fabulous, fabulous experience. Uh, for three years, then I was uh, uh, director of choirs, uh, choral activities at St. Cloud State University. And then moving on from there, went to uh, Augsburg College, where I was the choir director and became the chairman of the department. Uh, And while I was there, uh, I started Exultate. And uh, from then on, it's... That's the his, that's the history, and and I've been doing Exultati uh, full time since then. When you when you um, uh, started or began Exultati, was that your idea, or did you did somebody prompt you, or what kind of got you into? No, it was starting it was my, a choir. It was my idea, and there was a, there's a void in the Twin Cities where choirs, there are lots of choirs. Uh, this is the choral mecca of the, of the nation, yes. uh, mm-hmm. the, tw- the Twin Cities in Minnesota. And uh, <clears throat> there were many, many choirs, but no choirs that had their own orchestra. And that's still true. In fact, I believe that we are still the only professional chamber choir and orchestra in the nation uh, where we have our own orchestra, which, which means we don't rehearse with them once or quickly twice before a concert. We work with them three, four, five, six times before concerts. And so the, the camaraderie and the, and the ensemble sound gets much tighter. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's been really, really a, a wonderful I- idea to start with. And then uh, it has caused me to learn a great deal more about music. So my ears have been stretched like crazy hearing instruments and voices together. And it's been a fun, uh, fun experience. How did, how did you recruit the musicians? Isn't that hard to find an oboist, for example, or somebody that plays a, a very uh, um, difficult instrument that's not very common? Yeah, that's the beauty of the Twin Cities area in Minnesota. There are just a plethora of musicians, uh, both instrumentalists and singers here. Uh-huh. So I opened it up to auditions, and people came. Really? Uh, it was just really wonderful. Probably couldn't happen in almost any other spot except maybe New York City, San Francisco, Los Angeles, that kind of thing. But um, the the number of fine musicians here is just tremendous. Yeah, that's what Bjorn, t- my husband, yeah. uh, mentioned, that this is the music capital of the world, probably. That's why we have all these big... Uh, 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 you know, writers and conductors and people like that come here and, and right. perform music. It's, it comes with its problems, however, too, because we're all competing with each other. 
oh, yeah. for, for audience, and that's that's, that's a, a tough good thing, thing though. Yeah, what's well, it's good in in the in that we we have to do our best. I mean, yeah. you have to get better and better and better, or or you're left by the wayside because yeah. everybody else is getting better and better. <laughs> so. Exactly. Um, other than um, a repertoire of traditional classical music, um, has Exaltate also performed other genres of music in concert? Oh, sure. Uh, we've done madrigals. We've done um, uh, part songs. We've done um, um, Christmas Frostiana. music, I've heard you yeah. did, did as well. Frostiana. In fact, our recording of is the is the only one in the world uh, with full orchestra. And uh, that's all... Uh, based on poetry uh, of Robert Frost. Uh, and, uh, oh, right, right, right. Really, really wonderful text and, and music. Uh-huh. Christmas music. Christmas music. Folk music. Folk music, yes. Yeah, there's a lot of yep. variations. Yep. Uh, can you explain to the listeners why you chose the motto, I love this motto, music that moves the soul to describe the music of exultate? Yeah, music is a wonderful creation, uh, and it is... It affects every person on earth in one way or another, and each person uh, has their own own experience and their own reaction to uh, music when they hear it or perform it. Um, music that moves the soul uh, is a thing that because the very definition of music is music is the, the language of emotions. If it never becomes emotional, if it number, never moves you, by definition, it isn't music. Mm -hmm. It's sound. Or noise, so our goal is every time we perform to get to the point where we can move people's souls. Not only not only audiences, but people in the choir or in the orchestra. I remember this: the last concert we had at Christmas time, we were doing pieces, and I looked down, and the second violinist it was tears rolling down her face. Mm. Uh, these are professional musicians, right. which tells me, wow, they're getting it. It's going in the ears and to the heart. And that's what we're, our goal is to get to the hearts of people so that they experience the very language of emotions. Music does it like nothing else. Yeah. Uh, it, it can, and, and it hits everybody so differently. So we do programs that have lots of uh, variety. So we can reach them, not, maybe not that piece, or this piece will. Uh, and uh, the goal, literally, is to move people. Yeah. Uh, speaking of that, the concert that we're preparing right now that's on March 31st, April 1st and 2nd, is, I believe, uh, it is the most emotional concert I've ever conducted. Wow. And uh, we're thinking about even handing Kleenex out at the, <laughs> at the, at the doors before Aww. you go in. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's just, uh, that's the ultimate... A compliment for a conductor is that somebody walks up and says, "You moved me. This was really moving, and it touched my soul." Uh huh. I mean, I, I can speak personally that I've heard music that's done that to me. Mm -hmm. You know, and, you, and you're, you're you know driving in the car or something, and all of a sudden you spontaneously uh, tears start falling, you know, down right. your face, and you're like, wow, that's what music does, you know? And there's nothing else in our world that does that no. in the way yeah, it does. Exactly. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, and it's so wonderful that, it, and it's universal. The language, that language is a universal language. It affects people everywhere on earth from every background, every, every, uh, uh race. Every, I mean, it's, it's just an amazing thing. I feel, uh, very odd and humbled by it, uh, that I'm, placed in a position where I can control that and help to make that happen. Uh, my job as a conductor is not only the, the mundane of keeping things in time and all that, but is to help hopefully create an aesthetic experience for a performer and audience at the same time. Uh -huh. that's, that's a success. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you ever, uh, I don't think you can answer this if you want, have you ever actually experience tears during a performance oh, absolutely. yourself yeah there are there are times i'd look down i can't see the page because Aww, the tears are going that's uh, beautiful when something happens uh that that turns out exactly the way i think it should and it's moving uh yes of course i'm in, and oh, that's God. a very high plane also uh for me uh experiencing music is a difficult thing i have a hard time going to concerts and listening because i as the ears, as, as you get older and you, as you have more experience, they get sharper and sharper. So you hear the note that's flat or you hear the, the wrong entrance or you hear that and then that kind of destroys me. But when everything is happening, it's absolutely 
excellent. Then, then I moved immediately. Right. Uh, for a conductor, um, you study scores and get ready for rehearsals and things. And the rehearsals are all they are for is to make the sound coming out like it already is in my head. Mm-hmm. It's trying to match that right. of my interpretation of what, it, what it's going to be. So it's already there, and I work to get that sound. When it happens, immediately I have an experience, uh, and in front of the choir, I've broken in tears in front of the choir rehearsal. So, yes! You got that's it. it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's it's, it. It's yeah, really yeah. wonderful. Beautiful. Uh, who are some of the more intriguing um, composers you've, you've worked with? Um, and as a follow-up, can you talk about what it felt like to work with uh, the famous Paul Mueller, mm-hmm. who is most famous for composing the music for Prince William and Catherine Middleton's Wedding, amongst other great sure. co- compositions. Yeah, yeah, it's working with the composers is is both a good and a and a, and a difficult thing from time to time. <clears throat> most of the time, that I've had really good uh, uh, responses and re- relationships with the composers. <clears throat> that is, they're, they want to hear their music performed. I mean, they hear, they have it in their head, and now they want to hear it. So I, I, the way I work with them is I, I, we, we work on the music and then bring them in uh, to see how it is. And then if they want something changed, we change it. Uh, I always want to... as. As a musician, as a conductor, uh, it's as I said before to provide an aesthetic experience for composer. I mean, for uh, con- for singers and players and the audience, while maintaining the composer's intent. I believe the composer wrote the piece in a specific way and asks the the ensembles to do certain things, and I want to make sure that those things line up with the, with the composer. Sure, yeah. That's the success when the composer says, "Yes, that's that's it. That's wonderful." Then it, it that's a real experience, and for for most composers, um, it isn't terribly difficult to get them to to say, "Yes, that's great." Um, you understand the language they're writing and you figure out who they are and what they're doing and what they're trying to say in the music, and then you you produce that. Uh, uh, working with uh, local composers has been really wonderful. Um, and uh, Mark Shepard is one composer who lives here in the in the Twin Cities. He's written a number of pieces for Exultate, and we performed them under them. Um, the last time we did one, I, I went out to the audience to thank him uh, for it after we did his piece, and I reached out my hand to, to uh, shake his hand, and he grabbed me and, we, and hugged, uh, oh. simply because... What he was hearing was exactly what he wanted. Emotional, uh, that yeah. That yeah. to sound like. And that's really wonderful. You mentioned uh, Paul Mueller. Paul, Mueller. Paul Mueller's obviously a very famous composer. Uh, he's, uh, he uh, became famous in 2011 uh, when he wrote Ubi Caritas for William and Kate's wedding. It was done in Westminster Abbey. Uh, before this time and at this time, he was he was a professor at a, at a university in Scotland, and <clears throat> he wasn't really well known. He'd written some really nice pieces, but not not really known. Well, something like two point four billion people tuned in to, to watch the wedding, and so he told me that the next week he got seventy thousand emails, wow. and so his fame went from relatively quiet to just bang. He was on the on the scene and since has has been that way uh, like crazy he's written a piece for us uh, last year we we commissioned him and he wrote a, a, a cornucopia of christmas carols which we did uh, at christmas concerts just this last december uh i say he's uh, connected with the royals because he's written a number of pieces for the royal family uh for baptisms and weddings now and he has the coronation is coming on may 6th and he has not one but two pieces that he's no, composed really? that are going to be performed at the coronation How cool is that which is really really special That's, so he's actually writing pieces for the coronation of king Correct. King Charles. Correct. They're, they're, they're all both written. One is a Kyrie, uh, which is in the service, and then the other one is, uh, I'm really not supposed to say, but uh, we're friends, so he's told me. But I'll, I'll say it anyway because it's, we're so close to it. Um, at when, when the whole audience says, God save the king, there's a fanfare after that. Uh-huh. And Paul wrote the fanfare. Oh no! So, oh, wow. so it's really special, and he has a very good relationship with Charles uh, and uh, and the whole family, 
and uh, when the queen was alive he would he had lunch with her many times uh and so the stories that he tells about about her and what what she felt and be- believed just hilarious stuff yeah so, i heard she has a, a a a really amazing sense of humor i mean yes. everybody that uh was close to her whether it be a family member or somebody yeah ancillary to her, knew when they would go to her that she'd make them laugh somehow. Right, you know? And right. you don't get that from yeah, when you yeah. see her, right? Right. <laughs> so she came up to uh, to Paul one time and said, have you heard, you know the music of uh, Sir Maxwell Davis? And, and he said, well, yes, of course. Do you know his symphony and name the symphony, whatever number it was, I don't know, but because it was written for the Queen. And he said, yes, I, I know that one. She said, what do you think of it? And Paul said, well, it's, you know, there's some really interesting things. And she leaned in and it leaned into him and said, that's time I can't get back. <laughs> Meaning, obviously, she didn't like the piece. <laughs> she wasted her time there. So it's those kind of really witty things that, yeah, that she happen. Is, yeah, very witty. From what, for, again, I never spoke to the queen myself, but... <laughs> You know, when you watch her, she comes up very regal, you know, mm-hmm. like unapproachable. But from, for the people ha- that have actually met her and w- were in her presence, she was a remarkably funny person. Right, and right. She never would insult you. She did it, like you said, a roundabout way. Right, roundabout. <laughs> yes, it was always that way. And when in, if there's a long, usually there's a long line of people to meet the queen. And so Paul tells me that... Uh, when she could, when people come up to her and they shake her hand and and uh, they begin talking, when she's done when she's done talking with them, rather than so she's not impolite, she just takes her handbag and changes it to the other arm. And one of the one of the, her handlers comes in and says to the person, "Oh, come here! I, I would like you to meet this other person." And then the next person comes by. Oh, so wow. never insulting anybody. Little but, signals, but, yeah, yeah, but yeah, doing yeah. doing it kind of in but behind the scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. Um, so, um, in your opinion, this is again an opinion question. What was one of the most difficult pieces of music that you ever uh, performed with Exultate? Um, there have been a number of them. There's some uh, music settings, some Christmas uh, settings by some composers that are are very difficult. Um, doing. Uh, Leonard Bernstein's uh, Chichester Psalms. There are some difficult um, rhythms in there and percussion things. That fabulous, fabulous music, but takes a lot of work. But I don't, I don't think that, uh, difficulty is kind of a, a relative thing. Uh, if you spend the time to prepare scores, nothing becomes difficult after you've after you've done that. There are some that are more difficult to to learn, but once they're learned. It, it doesn't become difficult, right. and that—that's my job to learn it. Mm-hmm. So, but depending, on, I guess, on the um, the instrumentalist that's that's playing the piece, there could be parts that are very difficult for the violinist, for example, or for the percussionist, like you mentioned, Correct. right? I Correct. mean, yeah. uh, so it really would depend on yeah. what and instrument. The, and that's is. when we take it apart and say, okay, first violins only, and we 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 pound it in. If, if they're not, and of course, in, instrumental, especially here in the Twin Cities, they they study their music before they come to rehearsals. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, uh, this evening uh, we have first rehearsal with with the orchestra. They have had the music for several weeks, so I expect to they come in and it, it's mostly learned. Uh, their parts are all all ready to go. Mm-hmm. So, so you just uh, fine tune it, right, basically, to make an ensemble okay. sound out of right, tempos right. and and balancing and blending and those wow. kinds of things are wow, wow, what wow. we do in rehearsal. Then. Yeah. Well, how many how many instrumentalists do you have other than uh, the choir? I know it's pretty large, but um, do, uh, do you have? Do they vary from? It different varies pieces? depending on the on the uh, the music that we're doing. For example, uh, we're doing the seven last words of of Christ by. Uh, Theodore de Bois, and that's what we'll be rehearsing tonight. And there, there are 27 in the orchestra for that. And that's, that's fairly large for us, mm-hmm. uh, although we have had it larger. We do the Brahms Requiem or, the, or you know, some big, big works like that. Uh, <clears throat> but when you have uh, uh, all the strings and then two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, two bassoons, two horns, two trumpets, two, two trombones, I mean, it, it goes on and on. So it, it gets to be quite large. And that's how big the orchestra is for this next concert. 
Uh huh. Uh, uh, so, what are the, some of the uh, greatest challenges that you've experienced when it comes to working with a choir? Now, let's go into the choir now because we were discussing instrumental sure. uh, uh, instrumentalists. Is that the term you use, instrumental? Right. Right. Sure. Um, so, the, uh, dealing with choirs, uh, what are some of the challenges? In do in being a conductor for so many years now, uh, you really can put. Peg, and, any, and if any other conductors are listening, they'll say absolutely yes. Sopranos are very different than altos. Tenors are very different than basses. Men are very different than women. So in working with each section, you actually have to treat them differently. In order, to, I don't want to go into the, how they're different, but they are different. They're, it's a different, it's just like a different instrument has to be treated. The soprano is a different instrument than the alto. And they have different challenges, and I mean, they're high notes in sopranos. And but lots of times it's psychological. I can't hit that note. Therefore, I think I can't hit it. Therefore, I can't hit it. Mm-hmm. So it's working with uh, sopranos to try to get them to believe there are notes higher than that. And I demonstrate by singing a note higher than they can sing. You know, there's a note that's higher. It's written there. That's what the composer wants. We, it should sound just like everything else, even if it's a high C. So. And then each each one of the sections has those kinds of problems. Uh, working with the choirs, for me, the most frustrating thing working with the choirs is, is the length of time it takes them to learn the music. Uh, now we've solved that problem by having, there are actually assignments between rehearsals where they have to have the section learned or this piece learned, uh, all the notes out of the way and everything. And I give them all the markings, the uh, breath marks and crescendos and decrescendos. I do that by email. So they see a score and, and transfer the markings from the, their, from the score that, they, that I send them into their own parts. So mm-hmm. we never have to spend time doing that, mm-hmm. uh, which is great. So you, you solve those kinds of problems because, frankly, we never have enough rehearsal time. You have to, you have to get things done ahead of time. And it, when they work by themselves, uh, and they really, exultative singers really come to, to the plate. I mean, they really, they really do work. Out, quote, outside of class. Mm-hmm. Uh, and How long is ready. typically their, your rehearsal time period? Like months? You know, weeks? Uh, no, we'll have, uh, for, the, for this concert, we have uh, six rehearsals. So that's not very many. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, wait, I think it's seven, seven rehearsals. And um, that's... Well, it must be pretty good if, the, if, the, if they only need six rehearsals to get it done, right? Well, that's because they do the work outside of class. That's great, yeah. Which is, yeah, which is very great. Uh, and a piece, a piece by like the St. Matthew Passion of, of Bach or, or the B minor Mass, which is two, two to two and a half hours long, takes more rehearsal time. And uh-huh. uh, there are 27 movements in the B minor Mass, and 18 of them are choral. So that's like preparing 18 pieces, and they're all very demanding. So that is a difficult situation, yeah, yeah, yeah. and people really have to work hard. Yeah, and and I this is a question that I was always wondering about because I'm, I'm not <laughs> a musician like you are. Um, uh, how do you um, regulate, I guess is a word, uh, if some singers are louder than others and they may be too loud or too soft? Mm-hmm. Is there a way? Because like, I've, I've been to some choirs where there's one person that's outshining everybody and it, it, it gets grating, I guess, to me because I'm thinking like it should be more blended uh, what is your take on that? Yeah, that's a that's a difficult thing, but it's something that must be solved. Um, a lot of it is is solved through the audition process. Mm-hmm. They come in and do an audition, and I can tell if they're going to be the kind of singer that's going to be balanced and blended with other other people. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things that we have none of in the orchestra or the choir, we have no prima donnas. We all know what a prima donna is. You yes. think they've arrived? Well, I say every think, job has a prima donna. Right. If you think <laughs> so, I tell them if you think you've arrived, you can go arrive somewhere else. I don't care how good you are, yeah, but yeah. if you're not willing to to set that aside and work as a group, then you're not in here. Right. Uh, and I've had to release uh, a couple singers over the years, uh, right in rehearsal. They just they would not. I said, I'm sorry, you're you're no longer in here. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we all work together. That that solves that. So uh, uh, audition solves a lot of the problems of balance and blend. If a voice is so strident and can't make it a, a more dull or a richer, or warm sound, then it's not going to blend with other people. They they just don't make it in. Is it possible, like, to tell them um, so and so? Can you just lower it a few? Absolutely, vol- and in, volume in, on that. Yes, and in the rehearsal, I mean, in the uh, audition process, I do that. 
and I find how they can do it. I could, I could say they have to sing Silent Night. Everybody knows Silent Night, so they sing it, and some sing it as if, I mean, the poor little baby is going to wake up and scream. <laughs> so then I say, okay, can you sing it again and don't wake the baby? Yeah, keep the baby asleep. Yeah, yeah. and most can, some can't. Uh-huh. And they're, then, then also in the, in the audition process, you get their musicality. If they sing like, I don't know, sing like a, on a horse, whatever, with no feeling or anything, uh, then, I mean, you're not a musical person, I can't, right, I mean, we can't right. use that. You probably wouldn't have yeah. chosen them if they no, were like, but, yeah. Yeah. So a lot of it is all those problems are taken care of in, in auditions. But once we get into uh, into rehearsal, then there are some times, uh, for example, I, I know that in the choir, I won't say what section right now, there is a person who has a bright voice, but I know he or she can sing what's well, not so bright. So then I will be reminding them. I say, oh, I hear a bright voice, please don't, and they know who they are, so then they, they back off a little bit. That's great. Uh, ballast and Blend is also taken care of in how they're seated in the choir. Oh, really? You would never, oh. never seat somebody who set, stands or stands next to a person whose voice doesn't blend with theirs, or, or it's difficult to get it to blend. Oh, why would you do that? Okay. Put them with somebody th- that they can do, and th- that solves a lot of the problems. So we don't have a lot of balance and blend problems uh, in in choir. Never That's have cool. because they're limited in in uh, auditions or or it's taken care of by how the, the seating process yeah, yeah. is. Do you ever have the other end of the spectrum uh, problem where the person's not bright enough, like they're, so, they're, they're singing very low, and you want them to yeah. kick it up a few uh, you like, Yeah, you can ask them to have more volume, and, and, that, and that works too, but I, I'd never turn somebody down because they're not bright enough. In a choir, you want the blend and balance. Right, and right, there's right. where I use the, if there's a small group, that has to just blend, then I'd say, okay, you sing that, or you sing. And I can pl- pick the voice, because I know the voices. I can uh-huh. say, okay, you, 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 you sing that, and I, it's going to be blended yeah. immediately. Because I've noticed you do, you, you do have soloists. Correct. Because um, I've been to a few of your shows, and uh, there are some um, sopranos and um, baritones or, or mm-hmm. tenors that are really amazing, and they they yep. do they do outshine. But you don't hear that in the choir, right? Because they well, when they it, step out, that's a different thing. Exactly, and they sing in a different. Yeah. It's a different. They realm. have to know when to modulate their Correct. voice and to, yeah. And those people are smart musicians. I mean, if you're a soloist, you're a smart musician, and you know how to do that. Uh, if if they didn't, they wouldn't be in there. Yeah, Again, yeah. I don't care how good they are. Uh, if they if they're if they can't blend it, there's yeah. no there's no I in no. team, right? No, <laughs> <laughs> right? No, you heard that one, right? There's no I. Um, so, what are your fears about the lack of support and funding for music and the arts in the American education system? Because right now, you know, the, the, a lot of um, politicians are, are looking to cut. Mm-hmm. Funding for uh, for the arts. So, yeah. what what do what are you uh, uh, what it's, are your thoughts? It's about a that? complete misunderstanding of the value of music. Music, as I said, it moves people in all different ways, and to not have that in the education system or in our world, we would be in we would be in deep trouble. Mm-hmm. Uh, that rele- the release of the emotions within us, uh, music is the way to do that in a wholesome atmosphere. It's a wholesome thing to do. It's a it's a wonderful thing to do, and it doesn't hurt anyone. It only brings people together. Music is absolutely necessary for our culture, for our society, for growing and living and being with other people. It helps us release frustrations. It helps us gather friends. It uh, The camaraderie in choir and orchestra is just amazing. Uh, mm-hmm. And it would be horrible if all of that was gone. The support, uh, financial support for the arts is very low in America in comparison to other countries. Uh, in most other con- European countries, there are professional choirs that are funded by the state. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. Here that we only have, there are only a handful of professional choirs in the whole nation because t- the, simply the money is not there. You can't get it. Whereas in, in uh, Europe, the professional choirs are there, and they're and they're flourishing, and they're fabulous because that's all they do. That's their full time job, mm-hmm. so they better be good. Yeah, yeah. And so, what are, country, in your opinion, uh, hates to interrupt you? Uh, it, it, would you say is is 
an example of a great uh, amount of funding and a great choir and a sure a good system of working that uh, around um, the Scandinavian uh, countries have oh, yeah? wonderful wonderful okay. music wonderful choirs uh, also Germany does England does um, France France does somewhat less than the others but France does uh, Belgium all those uh, Italy they, they all Western have European they all Asia. have uh, wonderful wonderful choirs and then hugely in uh, Ukraine uh, and uh, and those those states that broke, broke off from the Russian uh, Empire uh, are all very very high value of choral music. Oh wow! Yeah. I didn't know that. And probably now with all this war going on there, they're, they're, it's a challenge. I would say it is a challenge, but they are, they still are singing. They are oh, still are doing. They? It. Oh yes, and Beautiful. Uh, and it obviously people flock to that because that their their emotional output and. And their emotional release uh, from the, all the frustration and horror that's going on around them. Yeah, music has a calming influence. Absolutely. Correct. Can you explain to the listeners uh, about um, this term, quote, graying of choirs? In other words, uh, the lack of younger people participating in choral um, activities. Um, I don't know that that's true. Um, the, the high schools that have choral programs are flourishing. Are they? Lots okay. of people. Because I heard this, and I just wanted yeah. to make sure that maybe it was, a, you know, hope, hopefully it wasn't true. It isn't like some of the other countries. Uh, for example, in Wales, uh, uh, in the British Isles, Wales, is the choral singing is a huge thing. There are children's choirs and young choirs, adult choirs. They're, they're just they're a singing population. In fact, uh, one of the Welsh things they say, you're born with music in your heart if you're a Welsh person. It's, it's already there. So, and they foster it and, and make singing an important function of, of being part of a society. How about church choirs? I've noticed I hear a lot of um, um, church musicians and um, church choir directors saying that they're, it's difficult to get younger people into those choirs. That is true. In Minnesota, it's more, uh, probably more difficult than others because the, the schools have good choirs. So those young people are already singing oh, in, in a okay. choir at school, and they don't like a glee and, club or yeah, something. So yeah, then they yeah, don't yeah. then they don't do in the in the church. Um, but with the decline of attendance at churches, uh, the pandemic took it, the churches have taken a huge oh, yes. hit in the mm-hmm. number of people who are atten- actually attending. That's obviously going to lower the number of people in choirs, also in churches. Yeah. Um, and some some churches do better than others in recruiting and and getting people to come back and, and do that. I, I wonder what the challenge was during COVID to get. Um, obviously, you know, each person's part had to be sung separately, and then they had um, technically had to you know blend them together. Did you have that issue? During You're talking COVID? about doing things online and. Although, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you can't remember, you couldn't be in a room together. Correct, right. um, yeah, that was very difficult. In fact, most choirs, even Exaltate, we we simply had to cancel our whole season. We didn't sing at all. Oh. There was no point. And and despite what what you've heard, you've heard some good quality of uh, things that were done online, where everybody sent in their part and it was all edited together. First of all, that takes a huge amount of time oh, yeah. and effort and money oh, yeah. to do that. But the results are not, they're not worth doing because you're really not moving people's hearts, the, the, the performers. I mean, you can, they're only singing by themselves. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it, it was a difficult thing. Maybe necessary. We tried it once and uh, it kind of worked and decided that the, the time spent doing it and the efforts just simply were not worth doing yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what are some of the uh, popular misconceptions about uh, the music-making process by people who may be unfamiliar with it? So what is a couple of things you could tell the audience about uh, common m- misconceptions sure. about music and making music and the whole... Probably one of the... the the best examples of that is um, music is to perform music well is far more difficult than most people think it is. It mm-hmm. takes a great deal of effort uh, by individuals coming together as, as a corporate group and doing something with one result. Uh, I tell people that the sopranos have one one voice part, altos another, tenors another, 
base. So that's one plus one plus one plus one is is we would say four, but it's not in music in choirs. It's five, because the resultant sound of all the four of those together is completely different than the separate ones. So we're always looking for the that fifth sound that's happening. That's not easy to get, uh, and that misconception that oh we can just you know come together and and do a concert. It's it takes a huge amount of effort uh, to do so. If I had to pay these people the same amount that somebody works at full time in a, even in a factory or or as a doctor or a nurse or whatever, uh, we we simply couldn't afford to, to exist. But they're working as hard as those pe- those people. Now, if if, if people want to um, see Exultate, purchase CDs, or do anything, do you do you have a website that they can go to? Um, sure. Um, and you know, purchase these items or look at upcoming concerts or anything. Absolutely, it's exultate dot org. E x u l t a t e dot o r g. Oh. Exultate literally means the Latin word. Ex- means leap for joy. Does it? And that's what exultate is. We leap for joy. Oh, in oh. well, I guess yeah, like exalting. Great, that's comes where, from that word. Super, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. <clears throat> Which is good. Um, yes, they can go to the website, and we have. Uh, we're one of the few groups, and probably have more CDs out than most groups in the in the nation. We have. Uh, there are th- at least thirty uh, recordings, uh, CDs, out on Amazon. 30. At least thirty on uh, Amazon, iTunes, uh, Spotify, all the all the things you can. You're name. on Spotify, correct? Nice. And uh, and they're all available. So you can buy them. You can rent them. You can you know all that kind of iTunes. You can buy one track. And there are hundreds and hundreds of tracks of yeah. of Exotat. We're because also, you actually have a recording studio in your home, correct? <laughs> <laughs> Which the audience probably doesn't know about. Yeah, so right, right. that helps. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, if you go to our website and just click on recordings, you'll see a host of, I, mean, I think there are nine or ten Christmas albums, uh, and then there's the St. Matthew Passion, the St. John Passion, the Bach B minor mass, Brahms Requiem, uh, Mozart Requiem, two different versions, uh, Seven Last Words, Frostiana, those are the big works, and then uh-huh. the all kinds of other smaller work. Great. So well, thank you, for, work. thank you for that. So uh, they can just go to exultate.org and look uh, look up your uh, upcoming schedules and Correct. music and all that fun stuff. That's right. um, so now uh, we've actually come to the part of the show that's good. We're going to change it up a little bit here. <laughs> uh, it's called The Shift. And uh, we shift the questioning away from your your comfort zone, like what you, what your career, basically. And we're going to talk about things that are happening in the country today. And this is more of an opinion now. You don't have to tell the audience uh, uh, about yourself anymore. This is just, you know, like how you feel about issues. Um, the first one I'd like to talk about is um, wokeness. Now, uh, I'm going to define it for you first, because in case the audience or you never heard this word. The definition of woke, it's a new word. It's actually been in the dictionary now, so um, it doesn't mean to wake up anymore. It means something else. Um, The definition of woke simply means being respectful, which is a good thing, right? You agree with that? (laughs) Yes. And embracing of uh, all marginalized communities. That's a good thing, too, yes, right? Isn't it? Is. Okay, so we've recently learned that Republicans are blaming wokeness for the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and other banks. Can you give us your thoughts on that? Do you think that, how could that be? I don't even know how it's, they could say that, but what are your I, thoughts about that? I don't know that wokeness has anything to do with the, with the banks. I think greed has lots to do with the banks oh, and how yeah. it's run and how they perform and, and the excellence of which they look at finance, financial things and make decisions at banks. Yeah. No bank should ever get to a point where it's going to implode like this. Yeah. They, Too big they should to have fail. Internal, yeah. internal things. That have really has nothing to do with wokeness. And uh, uh, banks ought to serve all all populations, marginalized yeah. or whatever, in this exactly. absolutely same way. I mean, we're, we are all human beings. We're all equal. We're, and we all have equal rights in our Constitution. Right, and, right. and 
it should, it should have nothing to do with banking. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, personally, if you ask me what I think the uh, caused all of this was the deregulation, letting them do whatever the, they wanted with people's money and Except you, that changes being after, after 2008. There were lots of regulations put in that were to protect. And the, uh, uh, honestly, the, it's the greed. It's the people who are running the, these things that are making decisions that are poor decisions and which cause things to happen mm-hmm. uh it i can't think of anything else it's yep. just it's no yeah just I, I agree with you and actually you know de- de- regulation and regulation sometimes regulation is great mm-hmm. sometimes regulation is not great and in this case i think it went a little too far by letting them just be you know do whatever they wanted and uh they, they were very reckless yeah. in my opinion but to blame it on marginalized people is very insulting and very, uh, is, uh, you know what I mean. They're using that as a scapegoat. Yes. It isn't, doesn't yes. mean anything. Yeah. Um, regulations, again, uh, there were more regulations put in after 2008 because of the huge debacle then and, and the massive bailout from the government for, on, for all these banks. Those banks came back fine, and they're making millions and billions of dollars now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, again, I will say it, that it's the mistakes and the, f- the failure is in the hands of those who are running the banks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Poor decisions. Yeah. Because what's happening, I think a lot of the people, when they see this is happening in a bank, they just all line up to take their money out. Right. Which is, a, which is really a mistake because um, your money is, is guaranteed by FDIC. And uh, exactly. for $250,000, most of us don't have that kind of money in a bank. <laughs> yeah. uh, so and so your, your money's safe. It's yeah, not yeah, going yeah. anywhere. You can right. always get it. Exactly. Uh, unless That's... you have more than that, then you put it in several banks and it's all, still all covered. Right, right, uh, right. So. Yeah. It's good, to, it's good to diversify, I guess, is a good word. Yeah. Correct. Um, now, we've learned uh, more about the Dominion Voting Systems defamation suit against Fox News. Now, you, uh, have you, are Correct. you familiar yeah. with mm-hmm. that? Um, so um, in text messages uh, presented as evidence against the network, it was revealed that uh, Fox News host Tucker Carlson referred to Trump as demonic. Now, this is somebody that, that you, you see him on the news saying how much he loves him, you know. Yeah. But he's calling him... These are private messages that have just been revealed uh, in the case. Calling him demonic and that he hates him, quote, passionately. Now, I think... I, I, you can comment on this if you feel comfortable, but I just find that so insulting that if you're supposed to be a news program... You know, remember the old days you had Walter Cronkite? Mm-hmm. Remember you turned on the, the news? The most trusted man in America yeah, yeah, was remember? Walter Cronkite. And you say he, he, would, he would read the news, and you'd be like, okay, Walter, good. I'm glad Correct. you told me that. This is wonderful. Thank you for informing me. Now you're getting people who are talking to you and are lying to your face, and they know it. Mm-hmm. See, because yeah, it's, 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 it's actually listed here. Yeah. In text messages. Yeah, it's proven. This this it, part is proven. Uh, he obviously lied and knew he was lying and did it for money. Uh, uh-huh. how, how could that be allowed in, in America with, you know, shouldn't news be fact? News should be facts, and it shouldn't be alternate facts. It should be facts. <laughs> Who there, said there that? Is uh, only, Kelly and Conway. Yeah, Kelly and Conway, she this. called. Yeah, there, yeah. Are, there, there is only, I mean, there are facts, and then they're not facts. And it, uh, the the news, all news organizations, their their motto should be the facts and only the facts and only the truth. Mm-hmm. Truth is completely different when you look at it from different sides, according to these different uh, operations. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't matter who gives the truth as long as the truth is given. Yeah. So if Fox News says something that is true, that's great. If CBS says something that's tr- not true, that's not good. Mm-hmm. But if they say it's true, obviously it's good. The difficulty comes from, from us, uh, f- for us citizens is to, is to figure out which one is the truth. Yeah, and the only way we can, it seems at this point, is go to court and dig and find the emails that that say these things. This is a proven fact. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dominion has a very good case uh, against against this of against Fox mm-hmm. for defaming their character and all that. And I wouldn't say that unless I knew the facts, and the facts are there. Yeah, this, this is, is a very this, to me. This is an important. Uh, 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 news uh, uh, revelation because to me if you can't look at the news and learn the truth then what the hell are they there for correct correct 
And uh, yeah, and uh, you said Walter Cronkite. Yeah, back back in the day, uh, you he was literally the quote the most trusted man, man in America. In Duke, yeah. uh, and uh, he he could have run for president probably and and, and gotten it. Mm-hmm. Maybe he wouldn't want to, but um, but uh, back then, yes, we did. We did trust them. Now, that doesn't mean that there were things put over our heads uh, even back then. I'm sure there were uh, things held private by the government or something they didn't want people to know. Mm-hmm. And so they told a different kind of different story, kind of kind of the truth, but not the truth. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but now it's gotten to a point where it's so clear. If you want to hear, if you want to hear fables and things, you turn one channel on. If you want to hear the truth or close to the truth, and you turn this other channel right, on. Right, right, right. But, but, but see, to me, in the old days, if a, if a news outlet made a mistake, like or if they lied or, or not, well, lied is a very rough term, but I mean said something that wasn't true, let's just put it that way. Do you remember the word retraction? Yeah. Do you remember that word? Oh, yes, it I was mean. a common thing. They would say, uh, yesterday we reported that blah, 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 but it wasn't, it really was blah, 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 blah. Right. So, it, 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 and, and we're not getting that from Fox. Fox is not retracting the information that, that they lied about. Right. Yeah. And, and that caused an insurrection on January the 6th. Correct. Correct. And even, even closer to, the, to our time now, Brian Williams with NBC. He told lies yeah, yeah, yeah. on on camera about him being in an and in he's a, on a, a liberal helicopter. station too. Yeah, so you can't. You, it, it goes both ways. Yeah. You know? when he, yeah. But but what happened? The the difference between now and then is what, uh, when he, when he did that, and it wasn't only a few years ago he did that, and they found out that he lied, and he was fired immediately, mm-hmm. uh, taken off the air because of the one lie he said that a helicopter were, he he was was being shot at while he was in it. Which was incorrect was Mm-mm. was false. It didn't happen, and uh, that was not truth. And NBC stepped on it immediately. And yeah, yeah, yeah. That. Now, That's correct. Yep. Now people <laughs> could say almost anything it becomes an opinion program rather than facts. Yeah, they might. Uh, you know, Fox might as well uh, hire George Santos to do the news if they're going to just, you I know, suppose. say whatever they want to say because yeah. it's not going to be true. I think, again, we have to get back to facts. Mm-hmm. You know, I would like to go back to the Walter Cronkite days where you could turn the news on and, and say, okay, that's what happened. Okay. There's not two stations with opposite views. Right. Like one station saying the vaccine is good for you, another station saying you can die from it. I mean, it's, it's very, to me, I don't know about you. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts about it? I mean, how it, it could actually affects safety in the right. country, right? I think the preponderance of evidence is is the way to decide. You you listen to both both of those newscasts and number one, many of the many of the things that are said simply do not make any sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're not listening to science or they're not I mean it's, it's just yeah, stupid. Listen to the science. So the more discerning listener can make a decision and say, "Okay, I, I really don't trust that place. Mm-hmm. I will I will go here." Uh, and one has to make that decision. Hopefully that's going to happen, you know, because so far they're still number one as far as news, uh, cable news is concerned. So, I don't know. It's kind of scary. Yeah. Um, so, of, of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, you know who he is, Ron yes. DeSantis. Yeah. Uh, and our former president have made appearances in Iowa, so apparently they're going to run against each other. This is going to be very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so Trump is already starting sharp attacks on DeSantis, you know, because he's saying right now, you're spending all this money and time in Iowa, but you haven't declared, and, you're, and the law in Florida says you have to drop out, uh, not, not be governor anymore if you're going to run. Oh. So he thinks it's, he's kind of, you know, playing both sides of the coin. Um, what are your thoughts about this? I call it the ba- clash of the titans. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't know that either one of them are titans, uh, but they, but it is a clash. Um, it will work itself out, obviously, in in the Republican uh, Party, whatever mm-hmm. the whatever the Republican Party is now, because it's a, it's so uh, fractured that we don't really know what's going on uh, there, and I, and they don't either. They need, they need to make, Republicans need to make a decision and to figure out how, what they're going to be doing. But DeSantis, uh, very popular in his, in his state. He won an overwhelming margin when he, the last election. Uh, he does not like Trump. 
Trump does not like him. So actually, it's for me, it's going to be kind of fun to watch how that plays out. I know. Who, which of those two wins, there are, I suppose, pe- some people would say there are good, good and bad things about who, I say there's only varied <laughs> things. Yeah. Neither, neither one of them, I, yeah. in my estimation, are of the caliber to, to do yeah. that. But the thing is, I you know, uh, I remember a time when, you know, there were debates, you know, and they were civil, mm-hmm. you know, um, no, I don't agree with that. I think it's blah, blah, blah. But now I think with this, you know, upcoming um, campaign with two very, very aggressive men who are very, um, I, I have, I'm sorry, this is my opinion. They're both nasty. I mean, that's my yeah. adjective to describe them because you don't hear uh, like Carly Fiorina, for example. Sure. You know, she was a normal Republican, sure. You know, just fiscal Republican. She wasn't attacking gays, or she wasn't worrying about wokeness, and she wasn't worrying about, you know, anything like that. What happened to those kind of um, candidates? Well, the climate in our country right now is really a, a dismal kind of thing. And you know, look yeah. at where even Republicans and Democrats can't get Democrats can't talk to each other, even outside of. Uh, the Senate chambers or whatever, yeah. which doesn't make any sense. It used to be that they were friends. Yes, they had they had different opinions, very, very strong opinions on two different sides, and they would debate those and, and respect each other during the whole process. That's all gone by the wayside, at least for now. Uh, helped along, I'm sorry, but really a lot by, by our former president, uh, who in, actually encouraged that. Uh, yeah, he, didn't he, like, um, I was watching one of his... Um, stump speeches and there was a protester in the audience screaming or something you know Mm -hmm. and he said i'd like to punch him in the Mm -hmm. you know what and it was cold out and he said throw him outside without his coat let him freeze you know i mean that kind of rhetoric to me is dangerous it sounds very mussolini like and very dangerous on all sides uh we need to get back to some civility yeah civility why can't we just, I mean, if you don't like, if, if, if you want your taxes cut, just say it, you know, don't, don't uh, use ad hominem to make a point, you know, and I think that's what's going on here with Trump and DeSantis. They're, they're going to use, oh, you're a da 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 and you're a da 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 but the, but the, the issues are not going to come out. So the voter is going to go, but what do you stand for? Right. I don't want to hear that you don't like the other guy and the other guy did this. What are you going to do? See what I'm saying? I I think that needs to change. Let's hope that does change. Yeah, yeah. Um, It was reported that both Trump and DeSantis are against sending weapons and assistance to uh, Ukraine, even as Russia has committed war crimes. Now, when I mean by war crimes, and I'm sure you're aware of this, Mm actually targeting civilians, Correct. bombing hospitals, uh, uh, apartment buildings, um, Correct. et cetera. Yep. And right there, you know, that's a war crime. Right. And um, should the United States, Canada, the European Union, et cetera, be more like Churchill and fight against countries that conquer sovereign countries or be more like Neville Chamberlain Mm-hmm. And stay out of it. What do you What, what do you yeah, think is a better way to be our Neville? Is, our, Cham- yeah, Chamberlain our world or? is very different than it was when when Churchill and Chamberlain were were involved. Uh-huh. Uh, there was one basic enemy, and we all got together and defeated well, him, yeah. Hitler. Uh, now the Ukrainian uh, the the war in Ukraine is is really really a cause for concern, and people there are lots of people in america say we shouldn't be involved in that stay out of that it's not it's a territorial thing it's them but it really isn't that's a de- democracy if that democracy fails uh the they will be emboldened to to keep attack going. other places yeah, and keep yeah. going uh we have to stop it before and we and we we cannot uh, abandon the ukrainians uh, we have to do everything that we can to make sure that that war does not go anywhere yeah, but those, else. And you think about it, though, Tom, right? Those poor people, my yeah. goodness. I mean, you see women in the street crying because their son's lying in the street dead. Um, 
babies are, you know, left in hospitals with nobody there to, you know, it's, it's inhumane. And I don't understand how he can get, even the people around him, how they don't say, you know what, dude, I think you're going a little too far here. You know, if you want to have a war, fight against the soldiers. That's what a war is about, not attacking the people. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yes, of course it does. I, I, I don't, I don't get this whole attacking the people. Maybe he feels uh, that's that's the way to you know um, get people to say. I think we should have enough. We should surrender, right? Well, sure. You get enough. You massacre enough of, enough of them. They say oh, we we all don't want to die. We have no we have no weapons as as citizens. So let's go to the table and make a deal. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that's what he's pushing for. Um, but but even not more importantly, but the the end result is. Uh, we we cannot allow that to happen in the world because democracy is is the best. It's a poor form of government, but as Churchill said, but it's, a, it's the best there is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, uh, we have to defend that, yeah, no yeah. matter where it is. Because if the the, the alternative <coughs> to democracy, Tom, is what autocracy, right? And look at would you want to live under a Putin or a, 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 a what's his name in uh, Kim Jong Un yeah. in, in yeah. North Korea or? Of course, Xi not. Jinping in China. I mean, this is a person who literally makes the laws himself. Correct. You don't have a right to say what you couldn't go in the street and protest. You couldn't say, oh, I don't think this is right. We should do this. That's why democracy is the way to go, because people have more rights in Correct. a democracy, whereas in the autocracy, it just it's the whim of the of the leader. It's the whim of the dictator. Correct. And that's scary to me. Yeah, it's very As scary. As a gay person. It's very scary for the whole world. Look, at, I mean, uh, you know, right now, if you look at the other side of the aisle, they're demonizing LGBT people. Now, I'm a gay man. I could walk, but I'm a white gay man, and I'm an old gay man. So, <laughs> But you wouldn't know I'm gay unless you, you know, I said, this is my husband. You know? yeah. But I'm walking in the street. Nobody's going to attack me because, you know, I'm a white gay, you know, white man, and I right. can fit in society. But you know the the new the new um, target of the trans people because they are some of them can be very obvious, and they're targets. So you know they they already did the, their damage with the gay community. Now they're going after the trans community. Why can't people just live their lives, leave people alone? If they're not bothering you, you know. Uh, it all goes back to the, the our constitution. All men are created, created equal. equal. We're all equal. Mm-hmm. There is no difference in the rights and privileges that we should have, no matter who you are mm-hmm. or where you're from or what you believe. It's exactly. all it's all the same. Prejudices have always been there. They always mm-hmm. will be there, and we have to continually fight against that so that we all have equal rights. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter. It, it, they're not here. When, when ever did a trans person do harm to to you, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, I, I mean, why, if they're listening, they attacking? shoot you, you <laughs> try to shoot you with something. That's a different story. But just letting them live their lives is, if that's a crime to you, then you have a problem because right. they are not bothering you. They're right. not. They're not yeah. uh, doing whether, anything against society. Whether you believe in it or not, whether you're for uh, gay rights or other, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference yeah, yeah, yeah. if you are, and you can hold those beliefs either way. Yeah. But but you don't treat them differently than anyone else. Yeah, and you know, some Tom, it's funny. As a gay man, I can tell you this can make you laugh. I don't understand trans people. <laughs> I don't understand why a man would want to be a woman. But that's not my. That's not the issue here. Does that make sense? Sure. I'm not a trans person, but I'm a gay person. Now, somebody may say, oh, I don't understand why a man would want to be with a man, or I don't understand why a woman. Would. Okay, fine. Now, I'm a gay man, and I'm looking at trans people and saying, leave them alone. Because even though I don't understand why a man would want to be a woman, Correct. that's them. That's their inherent feeling and their orientation that they can't change. If they can turn a knob back and forth, maybe they could do that, but it, they can't. It's who the person is. Just like anybody that chooses to uh, – not chooses because you don't choose to be gay um, – to be bisexual – you know, some people are able to formulate a love relationship with both sexes. There's something now. This the young people use this term, pan pansexual. Do you have you heard that sure, yeah, term? Yeah. Now that means I don't care uh, what you are, whether you're a, you're a, a trans person, a gay person, whatever. I if I connect with you, I I can be with you. So if these people are not harming you, 
what is your beef? <laughs> Correct. Correct. <laughs> yeah. And in our in our country, the Constitution is there, and that's and it is very clear. Mm-hmm. It's in the it's in the uh, how All men we are created treat equal. Trans- Even Martin Luther King said, you know, yeah. judge people by the contents of the character, not the Correct. color of their skin, or or anything else. Or anything else. Yeah. Uh, the final question before we end the show. Um, is one I've recently started asking on all my podcasts. Uh, since we are approaching the campaign season for the 2024 <coughs> presidential election, who do you think will be the nominee for the Democrats, and who do you think will be the nominee for the Republicans? Now, this is, again, a prognostication, sure, sure. Uh, because I, I, I love the answers I'm getting, so I, I, mm-hmm. I just want to... Well, I think for, uh, it's fairly easy for the Democrat. I think probably Biden will be the Democratic. Uh, he's done. He's done some... Incredible things as, as with president. With a one with uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with no um, majority in the Senate, fifty pretty much fifty correct, fifty correct. Senate, yeah. uh, and he's certainly not hurting anyone. Is is making things better and and keeping things. And he's got the experience in foreign affairs and all that stuff. Uh, so Democrats probably will stick with him. And then in the Republicans, I have absolutely no idea. Um, lots of uh, Republicans are now. Uh, Saying that Trump is not the person that that he's he's bygone. Well, if he gets in, if he gets indicted, that'll be, <laughs> that'll yeah, well, be more of a reason not to vote you know, for him. The right? Constitution doesn't say, say anything like that. But he's actually, he he could actually be president and in prison. No, you know, really? there's no, there's nothing in the Constitution that says he can. Really? Yep. That is interesting to know. He I could, didn't even he know could that. be president from prison. So he could he could run the country correct out of his cell. That's right. <laughs> he could. I mean, technically, yes. And oh, there, obviously, there'd be fights for it, but uh, against it. But but you uh, see, and I don't know about DeSantis, and I don't know about any of the other. Uh, I mean, the Republican Party has to come together somehow and yeah, yeah. choose someone who can represent did, all of them. Yeah, because if they did choose a normal <laughs> Republican, just like a run of the mill yeah. person who didn't hate anybody and who was just you know, I mm-hmm. I want to cut your taxes. Which was the Republican mantra for many years: cut right. your taxes. We're a Republican. We'll cut your taxes. They would win because there's that. If you're a Republican, you believe in that, you'll win. But the, the but the marginalizing other people, mm-hmm. saying these people are no good and these people are no good. You're you're subtracting rather than adding to your uh, 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 electorate. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? What I'm saying? Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, unfortunately, we've come to the end of the show. Did you have a good time? Absolutely. This was great. Yeah, yeah. You were great, great too. Can I say one more thing about, about oh, yeah, yeah. quote, my opinion? Uh, as a musician, as a, a leader, a, a conductor, uh, I make it a very strong effort not to bring politics or any anything uh, outside of music into rehearsals mm-hmm. or concerts. So me even saying the things that I have said now... I'm a little bit uncomfortable doing that because of my position uh, serving people. <coughs> we have we have marginalized community uh, members in our in our group. We have Republicans. We have Democrats. We have we have the whole gamut. We have a picture of society in our yeah. But there's thing. a lot of Republicans and, that don't hate people. Correct. Well, yeah, that's absolutely. So you're not really being partisan. You're just saying everybody should get along. Correct. I am. And that's not a bad and, but thing. I, to... But I really try very hard not to bring that into my, my profession uh, because music, it doesn't matter if you're a uniter, or yeah. It's all, it brings us all together. And yeah, that's yeah. what's important about music. Well, again, uh, we've come to the end of the show, with Tom. And uh, for more information about Tom and Exultate, it's exultate.org. Correct. And can you spell that one more yeah. time for the E X U L T A T E dot O R G. Exultate dot org means to leap for joy. Well, thank you again, Tom. Um, we really appreciate you uh, spending some time with us on the Downright Upright Show, especially with your busy schedule. So thank you again. And to the listeners, uh, thank you for spending time with us today. And please stay tuned for more of the Downright Upright show in the future. This is your host, Philip Anthony, saying ciao for now. Thank you.